Good morning and happy Sabbath, Church. Thanks for joining us here this morning. If you're joining us for the first time, I, I want to direct you to our website if you have any questions about who we are and what services we hold. On a weekly basis, we, we have a service on Wednesday evening at, at 7 p.m. And then on Saturday mornings, you can find us here at 9.30 a.m. All of this information is listed on our website, and we'd love for you to join us at either of those services. For those who are members with us and, and join us on a regular basis, welcome back and, and happy Sabbath. I just want to remind you, too, about our website. For, if you have any questions about, about our services, if you need links to our services, they're all found there as well. If you might need any supplies during this time, we might have some extra masks. So if you find yourself needing some masks, please let me know, reach out to me. My contact information is either on the bulletin or on the website. If you need anything, just feel free to contact me with any questions and we'll try to get you whatever you need during this time. Also on our website, you'll find links to, to donate to our ministry. You'll find a link to Adventist giving and you'll see a P.O. box listed there where you can mail checks if you choose to do it that way. For whatever you give, we, we thank you for all that you've, you've given to our ministry, how you continue to support our ministry, and we thank you for your faithfulness to, to this ministry. I also want to quickly remind you that we are still collecting donations toward a coronavirus relief fund. If, if you wish to donate to ADRA during this time as they continue to work and do um, service to, to different countries around the world during this pandemic, please, you'll find on Ad Adventist Giving Online and through our PO Box, you could give to the Coronavirus Relief Fund. Just please specify that that's where your funds should go and we will make sure that they make it in that direction. Once again, we thank you for all that you do, for all that you give. And as you continue to pray for our church and our ministry, I pray that you also find a sense of peace and rest this Sabbath morning. This morning, we're going to continue our sermon series on the book of Romans. We are going to finish up with chapter 7, and we will begin chapter 8 next week to conclude our series on the book of Romans. But for this week, we're going to dive into the very heart of human existence. We're going to dive into the very struggle that we all find ourselves in. And Paul is going to resonate with our very own experience. This week, he's, he's going to cry out for, for his wretchedness, for how miserable he is in the position that he is. But he's going to point towards a triumph. He's going to point us towards a victory, a victory that is much greater than our own, much greater than anything that we can accomplish. And he's going to say, it's all because of Jesus. He's going to lead us to that place. He's going to point us toward in that direction. And he's going to ask us to follow, to commit to that person. May this be a blessing to you and to all who listen this morning. Have you ever felt that you have trouble with committing to your expectations and to your responsibilities and to following through, really? If you're anything like me, I find myself that I struggle with this quite a bit saying that I'm going to do something, but then sometimes I, I start doing it or I might put it down for a little bit, I'll come back to it, but I'm never as consistent as I'd really love to be. It's something I know about myself. I'm, I'm very self-aware about this fact, and it's something that I, I, try to, I try to wrestle with. You know, it could be the fact that I got a gym membership and I'm trying to be more consistent in doing that. Obviously now that's all canceled, but there was something that I was trying to do, right? Or exercising more consistently outside. For a while I had a rock climbing membership and I would go once a month, so it was no longer really worth paying for that sort of membership. Or perhaps wanting to be more crafty or trying to get into different things. Perhaps it's reading more consistently, right? 
I have this expectation for myself. I set a bar for myself and I often find myself not quite meeting it as often as I'd like. There's no place where, where this might be more obvious than, than in my dieting. You know, a, a few years ago, I was, in, I was studying in Claremont and I took a class called Animal Ethics and Animal Theology. And I thought, what is animal theology? I, I've never quite heard of something like that, right? But I decided to take the course anyways. And throughout the 15 weeks, we studied many different sorts of things in this class. We study animal agency, we study the relationships of animals to humans, we looked at the way that animals interact with each other, the ways that they build, maybe primates build their own sort of social knit groups. And in, in short, we, we try to understand the ways it, animals think to see if they feel, if they have agency. We looked at the meat industry in the United States, the, the, the various different layers that play into the meat industry. And after 15 weeks of going through this class, I decided for myself that I wasn't going to, to eat meat anymore, that I wanted to be a vegetarian. And if possible, I wanted to be a vegan. And so that started my, my journey down this path, right? It wasn't so much for, for health reasons, although I, I admit that I, I believe those are really important, but it was more so because I, I couldn't quite come to terms with the meat industry in the United States. But the thing is, a couple months went by and I was doing pretty good. I was doing pretty good. But then, you know, Thanksgiving rolls around, the holidays, and, and I just have to say, well, you know, Oh, I can't, I can't really pass up that turkey this year. You know, like that's the staple. That's, that's kind of the, the, the thing that makes this holiday. I set a, an expectation for myself, a bar, something that I really believed in and something that I continue to believe in. But if you ask me last week, I, I had pizza with my family and there might have been a few pieces of chicken on there. Or if you asked me a few weeks ago, my friend wanted to order some takeout and, and they really wanted tacos. And so we ended up, we ended up ordering some tacos. Or you might think about the fact that next, next week there's this chicken place that I really wanted to try and it's been on my mind for the past few weeks. And I just can't help but think that next week I might finally cave in and try that new chicken sandwich that I've been dying to try. I was one of those persons that when I went camping with my friend, we would, we would purchase this like five pound tri-tip thing that's like three inches thick or something. And we would kind of slow roast it over the fire. And there was nothing better while camping than kind of slow roasting a tri-tip over the flame as we stared at the stars, talking around the campfire, waiting hours for this thing to cook, to finally eat it with, with some bread. It's this kind of tug and pull, this wrestling with the fact that I don't want to do these things, but I can't help but also really love, love the, the flavor of some of these things, right? On a small scale, this is what Paul is kind of getting at in this next chapter of this next section of chapter seven here. He's kind of getting at this wrestling on an existential level. He's, he's leveling with us here. He's, he's describing our human nature, the very essence of our existence here on earth. And he's, and he's wrestling with himself saying, the things that I want to do I don't do, and the things that I don't want to do, I, I end up doing. He's struggling with the fact that this is where he wrestles the most. All along, he's been trying to bring us together, bring these two groups of people together. First, describing the Gentiles as deserving the wrath of God for their actions, for their life. Then, just talking about the Jews in a way that they deserve the wrath of God for the way that they are hypocrites and the way that they chastise um, other groups. And here he's finally leveling everyone out 
and saying we are all in the same boat. No matter who you are, where you come from, what your background is, what it is that you believe in so dearly, we all struggle with this very fact that we do the things that we don't want to do and the things that we do want to do, we often fail to do. And so we start off this morning with chapter 7, verse 14, where he starts off this dialogue of our very human existence here. He says, So the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I am, I am all too human a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that what I am doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So I am not the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. The question here for Paul is about intention versus execution, right? It's fascinating that Paul says, I don't understand myself. I don't really quite get why this happens. And in light of everything that we talked about last week, talking about the grand deception that sin creates, right? This corruption of devout desire, its ability to, to make something that is intended for good into something that's bad and evil. How often we find that to be the case, right? How often we find to be the case the fact that we're trying as hard as we can to do something good. We have good intentions behind our actions, but sometimes without even knowing, without knowing how or why, they just turn sour right before our very eyes. There's this common saying that people say, and it, and it goes like this. They say, the road to hell is paved with, with good intentions. It's just this reality of the world, this reality that, as we said last week, that we've fallen, in some sense, powerless to. We are powerless to, the, to, the, to sin. All along, Paul has been bringing us to this point in chapter 6, saying that we can now choose a new master. We've been baptized into the life with Christ. We have freedom in Christ. And here we see Paul coming back and saying we are slaves to sin. We are slaves to sin, and he doesn't really quite understand why. He says, I'm not the one in doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. And you might say, Paul, that's kind of a cop-out. You're kind of blaming someone else, right? It's, it's sort of the thing that kids do sometimes where they want to get out of, out of this by blaming it on someone else, right? I used to do this with my sister all the time. Um, I would hurt her in some way, I might have punched her or like thrown something at her, and I would always want to blame her for hurting herself in some sort of way, right? It's this thing that happens. And Paul is kind of going this direction, and you might be tempted to say that's a cop-out, that's, that's childish, Paul. Why don't you just take responsibility for the things that you do? He continues. He says, I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful in my sinful nature. Nothing good lives in me. This, this in particular about Paul makes me a little bit uncomfortable. As someone who wants to see human beings as naturally inclined to some sort of good, Paul says that there's nothing good that lives in me. There's this sense where sin is me, but also sin isn't quite me. It's this kind of dis disjunction that we have here. Some people like to describe it as a split character. But I don't want to define the lines so clearly here. It's not to say that we are both good and both evil or that we have options for good and evil. But Paul is simply getting to the point that sometimes it's a question about expectations, commitment, and what we desire. Sin is, is me, but it's also not me. He continues in verse 19. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I'm not really the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. 
Here again, he, he's almost echoing the exact same thing he just said in verse 17, right? He's saying, I am not really the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. He's pointing towards this sort of existence. In, in, philosophy, in philosophy, we call it an ontology of sin, right? The very nature of things, the very way that the universe, the, the very existence in which we are, the essence of our existence, it's, it's that sin that sort of permeates all that is and all that we do, despite our best efforts. He continues in verse 21, I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I want to do what is right, but I inevitably do what is wrong. Forget my little coy example with vegetarianism, right? This is real stuff, stuff that we seriously struggle with, right? Whether it be anger, whether it be impatience, whether it be vices or addictions, whether it be any weaknesses that we have, we all strive towards something better. We all have this understanding that we want to be in a better place than we are now, but we find ourselves constantly falling and struggling with ourselves. And Paul here is resonating with that experience and he's saying, I'm tired of it. I'm sick and tired of this very existence that we all share. He says, I love God's law with all of my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind, he says. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Paul says that it's this principle in life. It's, again, this very existence that we share. Oftentimes in our spiritual lives, we we try to get though we might not always try, we get caught up with the law at times, right? This has been, after all, our our whole conversation for the past few weeks, this conversation about the law, the law's proper place. And here we see that Paul doesn't discredit the law because he's saying that the law is good. He loves it with all of his heart. And sometimes in our spiritual lives, in wanting to to keep that law in mind, in wanting to keep that law at the forefront of our of our hearts, we often sometimes get bogged down by the law because what the law does, as Paul has already stated, that it points out our sin. It points us in the direction and it reveals the things that we are and might be ashamed of. And, and in that revealing, sometimes we get so overwhelmed by, by the law to the point to the fact that we, we might be tempted to say, this is impossible. We can't, we can't quite follow this. We can't quite do this on our own. We're, we're being hypocrites because we're trying to follow this law. We are calling ourselves Christian, but here I am doing the things that I, I shouldn't be doing. So much so that for some people, this, this shame, this guilt of the law kind of becomes overwhelming because we've created this statue of what we think a Christian person should be, should look like. They shouldn't do X, Y, and Z. This all stems from our understanding of the law in, 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 our, in our lives. And some people are so overwhelmed by this pressure, by this guilt, by this burden, that they decide, I'd rather just not identify myself as a Christian and just say that I'm a good person. I try to act well in the world. I try to do what is right. That, that's, and I think that's going to be enough. It's a strong temptation because at the end of the day, in that sort of mindset, we think that the law is inevitably the thing that's going to save us, that the law is the thing that's kind of define and identify our lives as Christians. But this isn't the love that, that Paul is talking about for the law here. Because we struggle with sin. Yes, we were, we're going to struggle with sin. We're going to struggle with our weaknesses. We're going to struggle with anger, with impatience. We're going to harbor resentment toward one another. But we can't let any of that, we can't let any of that disqualify us from the power, from the victory that has been promised to us by Christ Jesus. We can't disqualify ourselves 
from that place. Because the life of Christians is a higher calling. We've been called for that purpose. Our trajectory is different so that we are no longer identified by those things that we struggle with. And so we will continue to struggle. We will continue to to work on these things together. But see, the interesting thing about this fact is if, if you've focused on your sin for too long, you realize you fall into that trap more and more. You fall into that well deeper and deeper. But Paul here is calling us, he says, focus on Christ. He's going to move us into this direction and he's going to say, focus on Christ. Your trajectory is going in that direction. Focus on the trajectory upon which you are going, he says. And when you focus in that direction, all these other little things will slowly fall away. When we're so consumed by the trajectory, by that new life, by that kingdom life that God is calling calling us to, that anger, that impatience, that resentment that we hold towards our brothers and sisters, that feeling that we need to be completely right, that things need to go our way, perhaps even the things that we like to harbor within ourselves, when we focus on that trajectory, I think things will begin to kind of dissipate and fall away. Paul continues with verse 24, he says, Oh, what a miserable person I am. Your translation probably says wretched. What a wretched man that I am, right? We see this in the hymns often, amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. The translation here is, what a miserable man that I am. Here is Paul's cry of just being sick and tired of being sick and tired. He's sick and tired of being sick and tired. He's overwhelmed by the very fact of this very existence. And he says, who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? This is his cry of desperation here. This is his cry of desperation. And and you know, it's not until we get to that point that we get to the point of crying of desperation that we realize how beside ourselves we are, that we need something, someone bigger and beyond us to get us to the place where we would would like to be. The person who has stopped trying to save themselves is the person that Jesus Christ finds the easiest to come and come and save, right? Lifeguards know this better than, than most people, right? Any lifeguard will tell you that when they go out and try to save someone, that it becomes, it's really difficult if the person is trying to save themselves at the same time. And it becomes very dangerous for the lifeguard if the person tries to do this. Have you ever tried, not tried, but have you ever felt like you were driving, d- drowning at some point? Have you ever felt that sudden sense of panic that just overwhelms your body? It's this moment where you're, you're not really sure if you're swimming or if you're drowning, if you're going to live or if you're going to go under. And you start kind of flailing your arms. This, this, this moment of desperation and exasperation kind of sets in and you're not really quite sure what to do. And so you start moving in any way that you can to try to save yourself from drowning. But if a lifeguard is coming out to save you, that sort of flailing, that sort of movement is dangerous for the lifeguard because you might hurt that person. You might hurt hurt the person who's trying to save you, injure them. And in that sense, you're putting at risk both of you. But the lifeguard knows that the only way that he can save you, that she can save you, is by holding on to someone who can just say, help me, help me, and allows themselves to be taken in. It's this moment of just kind of letting go and letting that person just hold on to you and bring you back to shore. In the same way, it is with our spiritual lives that we often try as much as we can with that I statement. 
that I can do better than this. I need to do better than this. I can do X, Y, and Z. I can set this sort of regimen. I can start building these habits. I can start building this will in this sort of way. We have books and stores scattered with books that, that kind of bring in this sort of mentality, right? That it's this I that can save. But I think it's Karl Barth that says that any sentence that begins with I is not fit for the freedom and liberation that you so seek. And so Paul says, thank God in verse 25, that the answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So you see how it is in my mind. I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. He says, thank God. And it's for this very reason that in chapter eight, he begins with that, that phrase that we know so well, that there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Do you, do you see why that phrase fits in so perfectly with where Paul is going? Starting in chapter seven, giving this cosmic perspective of the way sin infiltrates, deceives, misrepresents, and kind of um, consumes the very lives that we live in ways that we don't even, that we can't even begin to understand. And as much as we try to do good, as Paul has clearly described to us, that sin's power is, is such that it, it produces evil in that which was meant to be good. And it's in this hopeless situation that Paul finds his cry of desperation where he says, thank God, because now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus says that your ways are not my ways. Your path is not my path. God's calling us to a higher place. His trajectory is moving us to a higher place. This is the purpose for which we've been called. The Christian life is one that is not identified from by our weaknesses, but it's the one who sees the, the finish line. It's the Christian life that sees the finish line, that sees where we're going, that sees the kingdom of God being built and, and adds to it, builds on it and breathes life into that movement. For that is why we are here this morning, church, to be strengthened by one another, to build this community together, to see, to see snippets of God's kingdom coming together slowly as we await for the full, expectant, glorious redemption that is promised for us. May in your own situation, in whatever life has, has thrown your way, and whatever you struggle with, may you find that place in your life and say, I trust you, Lord Jesus, save me. Amen. <laughs>